Hello and welcome to Spotlight. So the indications are that a deal will be announced perhaps as early as tomorrow between the DUP and Theresa May, with the unionists promising to support the minority Tory government on a case-by-case -case basis in return for... What? Well, that's the unknown at the moment, and the details of the agreement haven't been leaked from Downing Street, where the discussions have been taking place. In the next hour, we'll try to sketch out what the shape of that deal might be, reviewing today's events with journalists from Dublin, Belfast and London, and taking the pulse of our local political parties as they work to get Stormont up and running in the next three weeks. But what a turnaround for the DUP leader Arlene Foster, almost toxic a few months ago in the RHI scandal. Now she's strutting her stuff at number 10, courted by the Prime Minister, the centre of national media attention. So what will have been on the DUP's shopping list? Mandy McCauley's been trying to find out. A week ago, this woman was looking wobbly out of Stormont, her political future in doubt. Now, that's all changed. Arlene Foster's roller coaster ride has brought her right to the heart of British politics. Future's bright. A divided country and a hung parliament have given Arlene Foster hold over the keys to this place, Downing Street. Smile! But her new prominence hasn't quite made her a household name. Any ideas? I haven't got a clue. Not so. But Mrs Foster is fast becoming a familiar face outside the Prime Minister's home. She is the leader of the DUP. It's the, um, the lady of the DUP party. I can't remember her first name. I can tell you who she is, but I can't tell you what her name is. Arlene Foster. I, that's the one, Arlene Foster. Arlene. Well, she's the Minister of Northern Ireland. She's the Minister of Northern Ireland. She's the leader of the DUP. But she's going to help Mrs May sort out the mess she's created. Arlene Foster may be slowly seeping into the British public's consciousness, but her party's sudden rise to prominence and power has unnerved some. Without her, Theresa May can't actually have a functioning government. So that's quite scary. Why is it scary? Uh, well, not just because uh, this election kind of exposed Theresa May's incompetence, but also because she has to rely on this person and this party who are actually, I think, are not very close to our values here. But Theresa May has been happy to call the DUP friends and allies and disregard negative reaction, even from Conservatives. They are certainly not our allies of choice. These MPs who believe in things like creationism and the evilness of homosexuality. We have a party like the DUP, which is anti-same-sex marriage, which denies climate change. I'm terrified about that. Yep, fact is I fundamentally disagree with the DUP about same-sex marriage. Many of their social um, views are things that I could literally, quite literally never, ever support. This Labour MP says some of the comment has gone too far even though she's likely to be effectively in opposition to the DUP. I've been very annoyed at reading some of the things that have been said about the DUP, and I think people forget that the DUP are elected by Northern Ireland people, so the, 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 the abuse almost that they took from some of the media was actually an abuse of Northern Ireland people. But what does that negative reaction to the DUP say about Northern Ireland's place in the Union? I think there, there is a sense in Northern Ireland that unionism has become detached from the rest of the UK. That's something which I think um, will not bother some people in the, in the DUP who simply don't care what people in London think about them, but others I think will be deeply alarmed because they realise that if they're deemed as beyond the pale by the mainstream in London, that's pretty alarming for, um, for unionists from, from a long-term perspective. A big turnout of voters from this loyalist area of Belfast helped propel the DUP to the position they enjoy today. These people aren't worried about the DUP's reception in London. People have said the DUP is uh, a backward party. Of course, I don't agree with everything that the DUP represents, but I do agree with the fact that they are willing to uphold the union. A lot of people we've spoken to in London would regard Northern Ireland as a place that they know nothing about. Does that worry you? No, it doesn't, because neither will. Neither will. And Theresa May is a unionist. No matter what anybody says, she's for the UK. What helps the DUP at home is that they may reap benefits from riding to the rescue of Theresa May.
and part of what the DUP is doing with the government now is presenting their shopping list. What's your price? It's not actually holding the government to ransom, but it's, it's, it's pretty near that. I think the main issue that the DUP will push for, and I would do it if I was in the DUP here, would be to get, um, you know, f finance more money here for infrastructure, for sorting out some of the issues that really need to be sorted out. Americans call it pork barrel politics, trading votes for something that will make the people back home lick their lips. Maybe there'd come a bit of money now if DUP got a bit of a spoke on the wheel. Get more money, they can get more money. I think they'll help the Conservatives, but they won't do it for nothing. But lavish generosity may not be so simple for a government that is starting out on shaky political ground. As a former director of the Executive's Information Service, Stephen Grimison knows all about dealing with the Treasury, and he believes they won't want to give up money easily. I think the idea that, that Theresa May will write them a large cheque of X billion, I think that's just not going to happen because that creates as much difficulties for Theresa May as it creates opportunities for the DUP. The drag anchor on this, in a sense, could be the Treasury because Treasury really doesn't like Northern Ireland, never has. If the Treasury believes that Theresa May is not here for the long term, they could just slow things down and it may not be um, the great uh, bounty that everyone p potentially thinks it could be. And of course, there's one other issue where the DUP's direct line to Downing Street now matters immensely. The talks to restore the executive. Westminster is one thing, but the DUP's real home is at Stormont. So can they use their newfound influence with the British government to bring back the Assembly? If uh, others decide that they're not coming back into the devolved administration here in Northern Ireland, then those issues will have to be dealt with at Westminster. If the DUP sort of do well on the national stage, do you think they'll want to go back into devolution here? I think that by the very nature of them, they are devolutionists and trying to get control of, of, of their own affairs. Um, but this gives them an opportunity to shine at a much higher level. It's, you know, they're moving from the Irish League to the Premiership. So they're not going to be playing Linfield and Torn every week. They're actually, there's a chance there for them to play against Chelsea and Manchester United. And I think that will be attractive. I think that the DUP are still extremely keen to get back into Stormont. They emphasise that throughout this campaign. They actually really, I think, have, have a mandate for that in a way that they have never had a mandate for that before. Sinn Féin says the talks to restore Stormont have been complicated by Downing Street's new dependence on the DUP claiming a compromised British government will now naturally support whatever the DUP wants. But the DUP's leader at Westminster pointed out the same could be said about Sinn Féin's ambitions to be part of the Dublin government. Are Sinn Féin now going to rule out, and they should be asked this, are they going to rule out taking any position in any future government in the Irish Republic because that would be a breach of the Good Friday Agreement? Because if that's what they say about us, then it applies to them equally. Brexit is looming, the executive is on ice, and the Prime Minister's future is looking neither strong nor stable. The familiar ground of UK politics is shifting. At this stage, all of the old certainties of UK and Northern Ireland politics are looking as flimsy as a cardboard cutout. Which leaves one central question. One smile. Will Arlene Foster's influence at Westminster become a permanent political landmark or just a fleeting memory? Mandy McCauley with her bestie. Now, Sinn Féin were in London today as well. There are now seven MPs posing for pictures at the Palace of Westminster. They'll not be taking their seats in the Commons. So the big question is, will the party's MLAs soon be taking their places at Stormont? Here's Jennifer O'Leary. The Diamond, Londonderry, last Sunday morning. A gathering in memory of the fallen of the Battle of Messines, the first time that Unionist and Nationalist soldiers fought side by side in the trenches. But history is being made in the present. Alicia McCallion is Sinn Féin's first MP in Derry in almost 100 years. By any definition, it was an historic result. 
This is a new era in Irish politics and I am absolutely delighted to take us forward in this new era. The city of John Hume had long been regarded as an SDLP stronghold. The party held the constituency of Foyle for 35 years. And for one of the SDLP's founding members, the loss of this seat is particularly sore. It's very sad and it's incredible. I, I, you take public representatives like Mark Durkin, Margaret Ritchie, people who have the capacity, who still have the capacity, to promote the best interests of the nationalist community in Northern Ireland. And the voters bypass them in favour of people who won't even go to Westminster. How do you explain it? For some, Sinn Féin benefited from what was seen as a straight fight between the DUP and Sinn Féin. I think that probably they realise this themselves, that it's not out of their, ex their own expertise and their wonderful achievements that they're getting the votes. It is because it is an arm wrestle. And nationalism is saying we need to be as strong as the unionist DUP, and the unionists are saying we need to be as strong as Sinn Féin. So anybody in the middle of that just squashed. And that's where the politics of the situation are at. The Westminster electoral map of Northern Ireland now shows a place divided. The polarisation of politics here has moved to another level. Apart from East Londonderry, every constituency west of the River Ban is now a Sinn Féin seat. And irrespective of how people voted in that region, no one there has any representation at Westminster because of Sinn Féin's abstentionist policy. A policy that the party insists will not be reversed. Are you saying there's no pressure to take that measure and end abstention? You're absolutely right in your assertion. There's no, there's pressure. no pressure on Sinn Féin to do anything except to fulfil the mandate we were just given. I think that one abstention is acceptable within the broad nationalist community, but two could be defined as careless. My reading is that Sinn Féin will be reasonably anxious uh, to get back into some kind of uh, to get back into the institutions. But if it doesn't happen, it's not the end of the world for them. You see, the difference is that they have another, they have another parliament. The Doyle in Dublin. Leinster House, where Doyle Aaron sits, is seen by many as Sinn Féin's main power base. Sinn Féin is now an electoral force on both sides of the border. But the leader of Fianna Fáil claims Sinn Féin miscalculated when it pulled out of Stormont. But there comes a time when you have to call it, and in my view the collapse of the executive didn't have to happen. Sinn Féin collapsed it to advance profile, to go for the border poll agenda uh, and to increase their electoral support. They've achieved that. Now is the time for them to come back into the executive, and they will. There will be the usual melodrama, uh, photo calls and all the rest of it, the choreography of talks that we've become very used to. Uh, and I think essentially, uh, in a short time, Sinn Féin and the DUP will be back in the executive. And everybody knows what's going to happen in the next month or so. It will be restored. Brexit revived Sinn Féin's campaign for a border poll and some suspect a further delay in the restoration of Stormont could help the party's case for a united Ireland. Gerry Adams, does Sinn Féin really want Stormont to get back up and running? The longer you stay out it may push the party's case for a united Ireland. No, we want, we want into the institutions. Uh, we want into the institutions because that's what the people desire, that's what the people voted for but also because strategically we think that is the way to a united Ireland. The reason why the institutions aren't in place is because the DUP have refused, deliberately, willfully refused to uh, embrace the rights-based issues, whether it's Irish language rights, whether it's the Charter of Rights, whether it's all the other entitlements that people should have under the terms of the agreement. So what we have to do is to persuade 
uh, the DUP, and we met with him yesterday and we put this to them very directly. Former Irish diplomat Ray Bassett was involved in the Good Friday Agreement talks and was Joint Secretary of the British-Irish Secretariat in Belfast. He believes Sinn Féin wants to return to Stormont, but only on its terms. I think um, Sinn Féin's position has been clearly bolstered by, 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 the, by the election results and therefore they're, they're resonating with that section of the electorate. So if they're going to do anything, it's got to be able to, they're, they're, their electorate have got to be able to wear it uh, and the leadership have got to be able to deliver whatever is agreed. So in the end, given the, the sort of polarisation that's occurred recently, I think it'd have to be a fairly substantial package to appeal to them and to appeal to their uh, electorate. As Stormont awaits the outcome of the Conservative and DUP discussions, the state of uncertainty continues. I think that there's so many moving parts uh, in this at the moment that it's going to take some time for everybody to get used to the new dispensation that the electoral result in Westminster has wrought uh, upon the politics of the North and indeed the wider politics as between East and West, as between London and Dublin. There's a new Taoiseach to be elected this week uh, in Dublin. What are his attitudes to the North uh, going to be? Pretty much a, a blank slate um, insofar as we can uh, ascertain as to anything that he has said about the North in, uh, in the past. So um, I think there's a great deal of uncertainty right at the time when everybody in the North says that what they want most is certainty about what Brexit will mean. I think they're going to have to wait some time before that emerges. In Jerry Adams' own words, never waste a crisis, never waste a difficulty. Sinn Féin may yet find an opportunity in the current political uncertainty. Well, as the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn said in the House of Commons this afternoon, with a pointed grin, democracy is a wondrous thing and can throw up some very unexpected results. With me to dissect the drama of the last few days, three seasoned observers, Ben Lowry from the Newsletter, Derville MacDonald from the Irish Independent, and in our London studio, Kevin Maguire, who's the Associate Editor at the Daily Mirror. You're all very welcome to Spotlight. Uh, ben, this is an extraordinary opportunity for the DUP, but it's important that they don't lose the run of themselves, isn't it? I think it's very important. I mean, this is, in one respect, an excellent result for the DUP, obviously, locally. I think a lot of unionists will have been wondering whether they would ever pull ahead of nationalism after the surge. Um, I certainly wondered that. I thought they would, and they did, massively. The DUP pulled far, far ahead. Now something quite unforeseen has happened. The threat isn't Sinn Féin. That's a long-term threat. The threat is now Jeremy Corbyn becoming Prime Minister, which almost no one foresaw. I think a lot of pundits didn't really believe the polls, um, even though they were pretty clear in the last fortnight, last month. And a situation could arise in which Jeremy Corbyn suddenly becomes Prime Minister. I, 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 I think it's entirely feasible now. He got 40% of the vote. So what I think the DUP should be doing is thinking, how do we prevent another election? In other words, I think the DUP should be very modest in their demands. And the other thing that's been really striking, I thought on Thursday night, Friday morning, this is actually quite a problem for the DUP. It's wonderful, they've got the influence, that's, that's uh, a situation that's really never happened in the history of Northern Ireland to this degree. But the other thing that I, I, I knew the DUP wouldn't be liked, I wasn't anticipating the tidal wave of venom. I mean, we have Tories proving that they don't like the DUP. Mm. So the DUP has to do a massive PR exercise. Yeah, Kevin Maguire, we've had them portrayed as Bible-thumping, homophobic misogynists, but uh, you will know that they're a pretty pragmatic bunch, or they can be, so do you think that the, the, the government, the opposition, the British people will come to love the DUP? I think come to love is uh, pushing it too far, but certainly Theresa May and the Conservative Party want their votes. And she, as the buyer, is very desperate and is prepared to pay a very high price for those votes. So the, the DUP, as the seller, is in a, in a very strong bargaining position. She doesn't actually need them to be in Westminster. She just doesn't need them to be voting against her. If, they, if she could pay them to stay away, I'm sure she would. But they are in a very strong position. And, of course, we know the DUP's animosity towards the current Labour leadership of... Uh, 
of uh, Jeremy Corbyn and uh, John McDonnell because they're uh, of their associations to Sinn Féin and uh, the IRA or former IRA members. And the DUP has that very careful balancing act. If it seemed to push it too far and the tail is wagging the dog too hard, there will be then that backlash. And certainly Ruth Davidson, the leader of the uh, Scottish to uh, Tories, the Tartan Tories. Uh, we, we know that on some of those social conservative issues, including uh, gay rights, she is very hostile to the DUP. Yes. Theresa May, she just wants those votes. Yeah, it's been made pretty clear by the DUP that those social aspects won't be in any shopping list, though. Uh, it's more about economics. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, of course, I, I would uh, imagine there'll be a lot of roads and bridges and money for the health service in, uh, in Northern Ireland. They will be able to get that. It'll be what else they want to do. For instance, they oppose the means testing of the winter fuel allowance, which was in the Conservative manifesto. Do they get an exemption for Northern Ireland, or do they push for an exemption in England and Wales too? Scotland already had its own, uh, its own exemption. So there's a lot of hard bargaining to do. Brexit, a huge issue, there are, uh, legacy issues. They will all come up. It's going to be fascinating to, to see how it plays out. Of course, they're expected to agree tomorrow, may slip a day, but we'll all be watching. There'll be a formal agreement, but is there a shadow agreement? Are there other understandings? Mm. Uh, Derval, no great sense of panic in Dublin. I mean, uh, the Taoiseach, well, he was the Taoiseach of the weekend. He's not any longer, of course, then Kenny Kenny called Theresa May. But Charlie Flanagan, the Foreign Affairs Minister, saying, well, it's not necessarily bad news for the peace process. No, well, well what they're trying to do is obviously not, not to panic too much. The priority for the Irish government is obviously um, the peace process. They take successive Irish governments take very, very seriously their role as co-guarantors of the peace process. Um, uh, today, uh, Enda Kenny, uh, the Taoiseach, left his role. Tomorrow, we'll have a new uh, Taoiseach in the form of Leo Varadkar, who has warned the DUP not to get too close um, to the Tories. But the biggest single challenge for the Republic of Ireland is Brexit. And I suspect that the Irish government, like many others, will be quite dismayed by the fact that there is no nationalist voice now um, in Westminster. And that policy... Although there's some degree of unanimity in the Northern Ireland parties for a soft Brexit, no hard border, etc., etc. I think what the Irish government is hoping to extract that kind of the silver lining out of all of this uh, chaos that we've seen um, in recent weeks is that possibly with the DUP having a stronger role at Westminster, that they, that might actually position them for a softer Brexit. And obviously that is a, a huge policy um, goal for them. But I think that the concern really at Westminster is, you know, that loss of a nationalist um, voice or vote was fine. I think Sinn Féin's abstentionist policy was fine when the um, SDLP was doing the hard yards or representing the nationalist voice of all hues at Westminster. But I think there will be a concern, especially if there's any delay on Stormont getting back up and running again. Yeah. Kevin, what do you think could prove the downfall of this relationship? Is there any issue? I mean, Stephen Grimmison, uh, former uh, head of press uh, at Stormont, was saying that, you know, the Treasury never liked Northern Ireland. And the idea that the Theresa May will be pouring tens of millions into our roads and hospitals could be just vetoed by the Treasury. No, absolutely. And uh, Theresa May is a very weak Prime Minister at the moment. Uh, she wanted to reshuffle her, her cabinet. We were briefed that it was very likely that Chancellor Philip Hammond would be going after what she thought was going to be that landslide. Didn't get it. He stayed. We know he's been pressing for a greater say in the Brexit negotiations. He wants to put the economy and jobs first. He wants to be softer rather than harder. So if she pushes him for money, it's very possible he will push back. But in a two trillion plus economy, finding tens of millions, hundreds of millions over a period of time, it's kind of a loose change if you're Theresa May and it's going to sustain you in power. It's going to keep the Conservatives in. As she said, she created the mess. She wants to get them out of the mess. Mm -hmm. She is prepared to find her own ma magic money tree, give it a shake, uh, fund the DUP if it sustains her in power. But, you know, the, D the DUP are pragmatic. They're hard bargainers. They're going to keep coming back for more. All right. Let's, let's look at, at Stormont then and the attempts to get Stormont back up and running. Ben, I mean, what, should the, the DUP be trying to uh, assuage the fears of uh, the SDLP and Sinn Féin? And if so, how might they do that? Well, I think the DUP have been pretty clear for a long time that they weren't issuing red lines. I mean, we at the newsletter would even say maybe they should have been a little stronger at that the, and, and should have been a little more demanding, but they clearly want uh, Stormont to be re-established. 
Um, and I and would. Yet there was a red line tonight, where, you know, when when Arlene Foster was saying, "Well, look, you know, if you, if you don't want to play along with with Stormont, the option, the alternative is direct rule." But there's a very yes. big difference between direct rule and direct rule with DUP in the driving seat, you know. And I think that that really, really puts really, really puts it up to Sinn Féin, you know, which until last Wednesday or Thursday could actually play quite hardball with um, mm. Stormont, having, you know, uh, it's kind of a, a faux or a contrived collapse of it earlier this year. But now more than ever, Sinn Féin needs it. So I think that the, that the DUP do have leverage here. The, there would have been an argument um, that direct rule is quite a good thing. I think direct rule has become very perilous because we don't know whether the London government will survive. So that's something that's good for nationalists. But the other thing is that's comforting for unionists. Sinn Féin didn't um, uh, come anywhere near the DUP this time in votes. So they, and, and, and I think it's Jerry Adams is clearly sending out signals when he talks about United Ireland, about them going back in. So if I was to bet, I would He's say also saying nice things about Arlene Foster and her Irish uh, adventure. I wonder whether um, after 2016, when the DUP was overly confident and Arlene Foster was overly confident, there's no doubt about that after uh, she thought she wasn't going to have another election for five years and that didn't work and it antagonised nationalists. Michelle O'Neill was overly confident in March, and that antagonised unionists on a, on a grand scale. I think both of them. Uh, and, I, I think yeah. both of them were wrong about that. But I think I, I, I hope that they've both learned the lessons that that's just not going to work. It's going to lead to really serious polarisation, and there seems to be a big softening of tone. So if I was betting, I'd say that there will be a deal. Yeah, but look at what happened when the DUP overplayed its hand, it galvanised Sinn Féin's support space. When Sinn Féin overplayed its hand last March, that galvanised um, the DUP, and that's what's brought us to, to, you know, to this situation. Mm. So I think kind of maybe one of the lessons from all of this, and it is really De top Dennis seat, Bradley was completely right, do you reckon, that it's just uh, the middle's been squeezed because increased sectarianism. Yeah, and when you look, like when you physically look at the map of Northern Ireland now, and, and Jennifer O'Leary alluded uh, to it, you know, in her report, you know, you have, you know, see it from the, the enclave on West Belfast, this tiny little piece of green, you know, you just have that, that green all along the border countries and, and the, the DUP red. And bizarrely, almost 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement, when you look at the Westminster map or the elections um, as it pertains to Northern Ireland, never has it been more sectarian. Mm. Ke Kevin, Kevin, broadly speaking, will the political world in Westminster take more note of Northern Ireland now? I, th I think so. I think it has to. Uh, both the op main opposition Labour Party and, the, of course, the governing Conservative Party, because Northern Ireland is in play in a UK-wide uh, matter. It's not just what happens in Northern Ireland now, it's what it means for the rest of the UK, who is in power, who is in opposition. Is there going to be an early general election? So, no, it's absolutely in play. You couldn't move, really, in and around Westminster today for uh, politicians from Northern Ireland. I, I went to see Sinn Féin, hope to see the DUP tomorrow, and certainly Sinn Féin, very, very concerned, saying that the Northern Ireland Secretary, James Brokenshire, according to them, is now compromised, can't play an honest broker role in Stormont coming, uh, resuming. And also they are quite aware, the DUP yeah. in the past, have tried to have their allowances uh, for Westminster, yeah. Westminster cut, although I think that would be more of a House of Commons issue right. rather, than the, rather than the government. Kevin Derville and Ben, thank you very much indeed. Well, senior figures from the Tories and the Labour Party have expressed unease about a DUP deal with Theresa May. The former Conservative PM, John Major, said nothing should be done to exaggerate the differences which make the peace process fragile. And Lord Hayne, a Labour Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, said the deal could plunge the peace process into jeopardy. I asked him if it wasn't hypocritical to criticise when Gordon Brown had signed it out DUP support when there was a hung parliament in 2010. At that stage in 2010, when Gordon Brown had lost the election but was still trying to form a government, he was talking to the Liberal Democrats. I was involved in that directly. That was the main discussion. He was talking to the DUP, yes, and he was talking to other parties, including the SDLP, and I think the Welsh Nationalists and the Scottish Nationalists were also part of the picture. So he was finding out what the picture was as to whether he could sustain his government. So he this talked is to very... anyone who could help him. Here we have ten seats that Theresa May needs. Of course she's going to go for them. Well, of course she, she could, and I don't blame the DUP. If I were in their shoes, I'd jump at it and see what I could get. But look at the cost in terms of Northern Ireland politics. She's actually putting her premiership and her party and its majority in Parliament, or its uh, attempt to get a parliamentary majority, which it doesn't have, before the P 
peace process in Northern Ireland, and I think that's deeply, deeply irresponsible and unforgivable. And John Major has said so as well, the former Conservative mm. Prime Minister. It's uh, not just Labour politicians who are saying mm. this, it's, it's Conservative conservative, respected elder states people and others who are saying it as well. Lord Trimble says it's moonshine. He says uh, you can be rigorously impartial in the Northern Ireland situation without giving up any of your political principles at Westminster. But say in the attempt to get Stormont up and running, which is absolutely vital to political stability and progress in Northern Ireland, if the DUP said, fine, we'll agree to do so, provided you give us something that we really want, uh, which compromises the Stormont uh, deal and means it isn't resurrected, then direct rule is imposed because actually the DUP can live with that. That's not their preference, but they can live with that much more easily than can nationalists and republicans. That seems to me to go to the heart of the problem. Mm, As I say, mm. I don't blame Theresa May for trying to stay in power. Uh, as Gordon Brown did, though he talked to all the parties, she's choosing one Northern Ireland party. And she cannot be neutral, as I was when I was negotiating with Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness and Gerry Adams and Peter Robinson. They knew I didn't have a vested interest. I wasn't favouring anybody. But, but and Sinn I wasn't dependent on anybody, right. as Theresa May will be. But Sinn Féin have already been saying for the last number of months that uh, James Brokenshaw isn't uh, an impartial chair of the talks to get Stormont up and running again. So actually nothing really has changed, has it? Well, I do have my criticisms of the way that David Cameron and Theresa May and their secretaries of state have handled Northern Ireland. I don't think they've been sufficiently hands-on. I don't think the prime ministers have been either. David Cameron was having cosy dinners with the DUP when parliamentary arithmetic was on the menu, not um, how we took forward Northern Ireland. And I heard that from at least one DUP MP. So they have been looking to their own party advantage for some time now. I don't think they really get Irish politics and Northern Ireland's politics in particular. That's my take on it. And it's shared by Paul Murphy, my predecessor. And I don't say that with any relish or any party yabu uh, uh, sort of politics, because I think Northern Ireland has traditionally been bipartisan. I want to see this Secretary of State, mm. and I would, whoever, whatever their party labels, succeed. Uh, and in the, particularly in the attempt to get Stormont yeah. up, and, uh, up and going again. Uh, Arlene Foster says if Sinn Féin are worried about undue DUP influence at, Sto at uh, Westminster, the answer is to get Stormont back up and running again. How do you think Sinn Féin might or should handle this if, if agreement is reached this week? Well, I hope Sinn Féin and the DUP will go the extra mile to make sure it happens. Because we can't continue forever like this or direct rule will be imposed and that will be a disaster including for the people of Northern Ireland. So I just hope everybody will get down to it and put their uh, partisanship aside and do the business that they've been elected to do. Otherwise, it doesn't seem to me that the whole Stormont edifice is sustainable. That, M, that uh, It's not a matter for me anymore, but I took this view when I was Secretary of State when things were dragging on. MLAs can't continue, it seems to me, to act as if they are doing their job when they're not drawing their salaries, drawing generous parliamentary allowances from mileage to staff allowances mm. and so on, uh, while actually the thing is not functioning. This yeah. cannot continue forever. In the meantime, if the DUP act as they say they will in, in the national interest in every case in this confidence and supply agreement or arrangement, uh, you could have uh, the Tory manifesto on the triple lock on pensions and on the means testing of the winter fuel payment changed. It could very well influence the type of Brexit that the government negotiates for. So it could actually be very good for the people of Northern Ireland, all of them, and indeed for the people of the United Kingdom. Yes, it could. And that's why, you know, and if the DUP succeeds in getting those things and getting them alone, good luck to them. I think it will change the nature of Theresa May's policies uh, on uh, whether it's the, the issues you've been mentioning, but particularly towards Brexit, because the DUP, to their credit, are in favour of an open border, uh, an invisible border like it is now. They were for Brexit, where Northern Ireland voted to remain, yes, but they want the border without any obstacles, without any security controls, and it's vital uh, and would be in contravention of the Good Friday Agreement if that did not happen. So if part of this arrangement, if it, is, um, if it is successfully concluded, if it is, 
uh, is that uh, we get a softer Brexit, then that will have beneficial implications for the island okay. of Ireland as well as the rest of Britain. So there are some silver linings on this, but I come back to my principal point. It compromises the independence, the neutrality of the Secretary of State and the Prime Minister as negotiators, facilitators of the party talks and ultimately of progress in Northern Ireland. And that's what worries me deeply, okay. as it does John Major, a cons ah. former Conservative Prime Minister as well. Lord Hayne, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. Lord Hayne in Cardiff this afternoon. Well, still Taoiseach at the weekend, and Kenny phoned Theresa May to express his concern about a DUP deal as to the views of a former Irish government minister, Pat Rabbit. Mr Rabbit, a very good evening to you. Now, Charlie Flanagan, the Foreign Affairs Minister, said that uh, a deal doesn't necessarily undermine the process. That's what you'd call a, a, a guarded welcome. Well, I think Charlie Flanagan is probably just facing up to the reality I mean, I understand the reservations expressed by Peter Hain, but I think the reality is that tomorrow we will have a deal and you have to contend with that reality. I think myself it probably offers a, a new impetus uh, to the talks to get the institutions up and running again at Stormont. And then if, if you set aside the 30 years before 1998, nothing more serious has ever confronted both parts of this island, north and south, than the Brexit situation. Well, we'll talk about Brexit in a moment, but I mean, the government is supposed, both governments are supposed to operate with rigorous impartiality. Is there a fear in Dublin that that is in some way compromised by a deal? I think maybe if there was a formal coalition, uh, there may be deeper concern. I mean, it is jointly co-chaired. And in those circumstances, I think the Irish government is very happy to believe that the foreign minister of the day uh, can ensure that the secretary of state is kept on the straight and narrow. So yeah, you think they'd certainly be prepared to do that, to call the government out, to call the Tories out if, yes, if I they think thought so. it had gone too far? Yes, I think so. And I don't think that is the deepest concern when confronted, uh, a new Thysia confronted with a situation where there is no government in Northern Ireland when we have to face some of the most difficult issues that we have faced since both parts of the island joined the EEC as it then was. Difficult, though, for the, the British government and the DUP to convince Sinn Féin that uh, the government can be an impartial uh, handler in this issue. Oh, I'm not so sure that Sinn Féin are as deeply concerned uh, as they say. Don't they say that the Secretary of State and the Tory government is not impartial anyway? So, you know, it's a, it's a matter of nuance. I think the more important issue here is how will the DUP use their new leverage? If they use it merely for pork barrel politics or only for pork, pork barrel politics, then it's an opportunity lost. But on the other hand, uh, they could use it to be an influence in the type of Brexit that we're going to see. Indeed, Brian Hayes, the Fine Gael MEP, has said, let's milk this for all it's worth. I agree with him. Uh, I think that if you look at the situation where the Tories in Scotland are, read, are led by Ruth Davison and her 13 MPs have expressed a very clear view against the hard Brexit favoured by the Prime Minister, uh, when you look at the situation of the Scottish National Party, when you look at the situation in the Welsh Assembly, well then, if the DUP were to throw their weight behind a moderating influence, because don't make any mistake about it, Noel, uh, this is a negative for both parts of the island. Because we don't know the shape of it, we don't know how negative. But there's one thing sure, and that is that if the UK crashes out of uh, the uh, European Union without a deal, then that is a calamitous act of self-harm. And there were indications that uh, there was agreement between the Northern Ireland parties on, on the kind of Brexit that might be envisaged before the pause for the electoral campaign. Does that kind of agreement augur well for getting Stormont back up and running again? I think it does, and uh, I think it uh, augurs well uh, for the fact that uh, the DUP, hopefully, is not going to descend merely to pork barrel politics uh, for its side of the community or even for Northern Ireland because there is a bigger picture here. Mm. Uh, we need a, a devolved administration in Northern Ireland 
and we need it because the next 18 months we are confronting uh, a danger that I think st some people still misunderstand. I mean, the frightening thing is there was a seven week selection uh, uh, across the water and, uh, you know, we're no wiser about what Mrs May and her acolytes, yeah. who accidentally got us into the mess, uh, what they mean. Uh, by Brexit. All right, Pat Rabbit, thank you very much indeed. Well, while all eyes have been on Westminster, attempts have been restarted to get uh, the storm at Humpty Dumpty back together again. Let's uh, try and analyse how a deal this week might affect those talks with my panel of guests. You're all very welcome. Uh, Conor Murphy for Sinn Féin. Uh, Mr Hazard was saying in London today, the MP for Newry and South Armagh, that he couldn't... Uh, uh, I'm sorry for South yes. Down, I do beg your pardon, uh, that uh, he couldn't imagine a deal which would be good for Northern Ireland. Well, what about a deal that brought more money, more schools, better health care, lowered corporation tax, got rid of the bedroom tax, made for a soft Brexit? That's a good deal, isn't it? Well, that remains to be seen. We don't know what's been negotiated in Downing Street, uh, and we would like some transparency around all of that. Previous times, unionists have gone to try and influence the British government. It has been around issues of interest to the unionist community only. Uh, and so we're going on the experience of the past record uh, of the unionist parties in, in their approach mm. to this. Uh, so let's see what shapes up tomorrow. Uh, I hope there's transparency. I hope that everything that is agreed is obvious and on the table because it will have implications for the negotiations going on in Stormont. We do want to see the institutions returned. Uh, we don't want to see uh, any added complications coming from this arrangement in London, which will uh, prevent that happening. Uh, but we will want to see the content of that deal. And but but you'd be are. prepared to welcome some, some of the items in that list anyway? Well, we have been battling that sometimes in a loan uh, way in the executive uh, austerity, uh, the policies of the British government. Uh, the DUP have never been uh, uh, as opposed to austerity. So therefore, when people tell me that that's what they're over there battling for, it, uh, naturally we're sceptical about it because in, in the issues of Brexit and the issues of austerity, largely the DUP and the Tory party have been on the same, same page. If there's some alteration to that, then we'll have a look at all of that. Uh, but we don't yet know the content of this and we want to make sure that everything that is agreed and every understanding that there is, is upfront and transparent so people can, can see how it, uh, it, it applies uh, okay. to the very tricky situation we're trying to resolve in Stormont. Nelson McCausland is with us, former uh, DUP minister, of course. Uh, we did ask the DUP for uh, an interview. They refused that request. So you're here just to give us your views uh, mm -hmm. on what's happening. I'm not sure if you know the deal. I'm sure you wouldn't tell us if you did. But how would you seek to reassure Sinn Féin? Well, I, I don't know the deal. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that at about half past uh, ten tonight, uh, there were still conversations going on and I think uh, the DUP representatives were just going off at that point to get something to eat. So there's a lot of uh, talking that has happened. Uh, the prediction is being made there by your programme that uh, there will be an announcement tomorrow. I would just give this word of caution that if you look back to the time of the negotiations at Hillsborough, Gordon Brown came over thinking he was going to make an announcement almost immediately and three days later it uh, took yes. time to get there. Yeah. But so, the DUP wouldn't want to upset the Queen by postponing the opening of Parliament. Oh, I, I think that would be totally improper. All right, so that because it's going to happen on Monday. So the chances are. That, anyway, have you, have you any notion of, of the shape of a deal? Well, we kind of know the sort of thing we're talking about. Corporation tax, uh, passenger duty at the airports, more money for infrastructure. Are we talking in the right lines here? Well, the, the DUP will have gone into these negotiations on the basis of being unionists. They'll want to make sure that whatever happens is for the benefit of the whole of the United Kingdom. And, they're and all the people of Northern Ireland? Of course, who are part of the United Kingdom. It's therefore important that, bear in mind also, they're talking to a Prime Minister in Theresa May, who is a proud unionist and talked about the precious bond of the union. So there's an interest in the whole of the United Kingdom, not just in Northern Ireland, but Northern Ireland is very, very high on the agenda. Mm. Robin Swan, Ulster Unionist leader, of course, good evening to you. Now, I guess in other circumstances, it might have been you uh, and your mm -hmm. party going into these talks. How would you like to see the DUP play it? Well, look, I, I hope the DUP play it for the benefit of Northern Ireland and the UK, no, because that's, that's the key to being a unionist. That's, that's why we're there and that, that's what the DUP should be doing at this moment in time. They should be playing hardball with the British government if they want their support. And that's for the benefit of. But, the whole, but in, of in the, what of in what matter. areas? Well, look, I think the list that you read out on APD, mm -hmm. corporation tax, investment in hospital and roads, is what any Northern Ireland politician will be arguing for. 
But the and the Treasury will be saying, no way. If we give it to you, we've got to give it to Stor uh, Scotland, we've got to give it to Wales. Well, and, and the DUP should be on there pitching their case for that, and I hope they are. That's what we would be doing. That's what we've been doing. But it also, they have to be careful as well, and I think it was mentioned earlier on, in relation to Scotland and Wales, because not only will, you know, if, if what comes from Northern Ireland has to go for the rest of the devolved regions as well. And I think where Theresa May's problem comes with the Scottish Tories is that any money that's given to Scotland isn't actually given to the Scottish Tories to spend. It's given to the SNP to spend. So it actually strengthens the opposition to her own party okay. in Scotland. So there's dangers there in what they have to do and how they balance that. Doris Kelly for the SDLP, Colm Eastwood, has been saying what happens in Downing Street is inextricably linked to the success or failure of the Stormont talks. He's calling for an independent chairman. That's just not going to happen, is it? Well, let's see. Uh, we have been very clear uh, for some time, as have some other parties that we don't see um, uh, James Broken Chair as an independent chair. But what we want to see is a step change in terms of the talks to get Stormont up and running. You know, we have had several weeks now of uh, bilaterals, multi talks, and some round tables. We really need to see the colour of the money on the table and see whether parties are actually prepared to compromise and actually work in the best interests of all. Uh, you know, last week uh, people very clearly bought the Sinn Fein argument around abstentionism and whether or not it was worthwhile taking uh, what value there was in taking your seats uh, in the House of Commons. Well, very much today, I think we're all very alert to the importance of taking your seat in Westminster. And it's to our dismay that uh, this is the first time in 200 years that there hasn't been and won't be a nationalist uh, voice uh, on the floor uh, of the House of Commons. Mm. Uh, Stephen Fay for the uh, Alliance Party. What, what are your fears with regard to a DUP deal? Well, I think that the deal that we see sometime this week, potentially, uh, on the surface will be fairly benign and, and, and fairly plausible. I think the real danger lies in terms of any side deals that, that are there, and we have a history of side deals in terms of our, of our particular peace process, and, and the DEP, uh, like Sinn Féin, have, have done those uh, in the past. And also the fear that um, the DEP end up with a certain hold over the Conservative government um, and the ability of the Secretary of State to be uh, impartial. Um, there is that risk that if things are pushed too far, in terms of, of uh, the, the talks that the DEP could potentially not, not f carry through in terms of their own uh, particular commitments in terms of the confidence and mm. supply arrangements. And, the, and, and, and the benefits? Well, the, well on, on the benefits uh, in terms of the deal, I, th I think it's very important to bear in mind that money is very welcome for Northern Ireland, but in terms of addressing our economy, that's not the core issue. The core issue is going to be the, the nature of the relationship with the UK and in particular Northern Ireland to the European Union. So Brexit has to be at the top of the pile. Otherwise, the, the, the extra money is simply a sticky a sticking plaster, gets us further down the road, but it doesn't address the structural issue. And the key issue in that regard is if the DEP are committed to an open border on the island of Ireland, which I very much welcome, they have to follow through and, and say that that means out of the UK as a whole, or some arrangement around Northern Ireland, we have to stay inside the customs union and the common external tariff. If we don't, uh, our border is inevitable on the island of Ireland. That's the, the real challenge, Dolores. Well, well, what we would be concerned about, I mean, obviously some of the talks that we are having in, uh, at Stormont to get the Assembly up and on again isn't around legacy, and we've already had a House of Commons report in relation to prosecution of uh, former soldiers. That's a major concern. And uh, whilst any economic package I think would be most welcome, uh, it would also be uh, important that uh, it's on a needs based and if the DUP and others are saying it's the best interest of all the people of Northern Ireland then we would reasonably expect a large chunk of that investment to go west of the ban yeah. and, and I note with interest the warning if you like albeit very mild uh, from uh, Mervyn Gibson earlier today in relation to the expectations of the Orange Order and, and you know the longer this weak government continues we could see the, the DUP and others using uh, their influence uh, not in the best interests of all the people of Northern Ireland. Ireland. Conor Murphy, Arlene Foster has put it to you, if you don't like the idea of increased DUP influence at Westminster, get Stormont up and running again. Well, our intention is to get Stormont up and running again. It's nothing to do with the DUP's influence in Westminster, as Jerry Adams outlined. We want the institutions to work. Uh, we see value in the institutions. The issues that brought the institutions down have not yet been addressed. The issue of the allegations of corruption around the RHI scandal, uh, the issues of the denial of rights. The but refusal, it's underway. I mean, that's the refusal. a judge-led inquiry now. Yes, so there is. A, there you is can a put that aside, surely. Well, there is a judge-led inquiry, but there are still issues of confidence around what happened at that time that need to be addressed. But are you not going to look a bit silly refusing to uh, allow Arlene Foster to go forward as First Minister when she is effectively the second most important and powerful politician in the United Kingdom right now.
Well, be that as it may, and however long that arrangement lasts in London is another question. Uh, the reality is, is we had a confidence issue around the RHI scandal, her role in it, uh, allegations by her colleagues about other colleagues and their involvement in, in, in what amounted to allegations of corruption. Uh, that was the tipping point that brought the executive down. Those issues need to be addressed. Public confidence need to be restored. The issues of denial of rights need to be addressed. Implementation of agreements that we already had uh, need to be addressed. These are all fairly simple things in terms of, of how they have stacked up, uh, but they need to be addressed and the DUP need to come forward. We want the institution to work. Whatever happens in, in London politics and the imaginations uh, 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 there. Uh, uh, and are Arlene Foster as, as First Minister is still a red line for you. You won't go well, back we, into we, we have said We that. have said that the issue of Arlene Foster's role in relation to that, other parties uh, around the table here with me tonight uh, took a position in December that Arlene Foster should be put out of office for six mm -hmm. months. We say that she should step aside uh, in a, a, a part of this uh, in investigation that was going on. We took a more measured approach to it. We still think that that is, is necessary in order to restore confidence. I think now we stand alone in that position, ironically, when we've been berated for not being strong enough prior to Christmas. Uh, but the reality is these issues have to be addressed. Uh, we've been speaking to the DUP about them, and we want to see them resolved. We want to resolve them with the other well, parties. No, as well. I have Just to take exception sorry, to, sorry. to, to, what, to, to what, what Connor was saying, because, you know, you're talking about rights, talking about the Irish Language Act. Patsy McGlone tabled an Irish Language Act. It was not in the programme for government that was agreed by the DUP and Sinn Féin. And I think with our party going into opposition alongside some of the other parties, we exposed uh, DUP and Sinn Féin in terms of their mismanagement oh. in the best interest of everyone okay. here in the That's North. Because. Yes. Um, in the election, the DUP secured 292,000 votes. They didn't stand in for Manus South Tyrone. So if you add another figure in for that, you're talking roughly 316,000 votes. Now that's, I think, from the unions community, a strong measure of support for Arlene Foster. And I think also uh, we need well, to Well, there was never any doubt of that support, oh, of course. Was, that's not the there, problem. Let's be very clear. Yeah. I think the strength of the vote yeah. surprised most people, even most commentators. I was in the studio on the night of the count, and yeah, but, there was but, surprise but, but, uh, all right, even from people in the BBC. Yeah, but at what, the strength what, of the what, vote what's your DUP. point? It's, she doesn't have to convince DUP supporters well, to convince Sinn Féin. Let me just Fain. pick up on that point. If you look back, and I think we can all remember that uh, there was only one case, because uh, Conor Murphy talked a lot there about scandal, there was only one case where uh, a minister in the executive was actually brought before a Labour tribunal and found guilty of discrimination. And, Nelson saw and that person right, indeed so was Conor Murphy. He knows the only person who and ever the reason the, the DUP, the reason the DUP ever didn't pursue that is because a they were privy to the legal advice to that case and, and they knew and the findings guilty. were All right. okay. Okay. Let, 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 let's, let's not yeah, let's bring it yeah. let's leave that for a moment Robins. No, again we're back to this scenario with Sinn Féin and the DUP casting up dispersions about each other's characters the 29th of June is the deadline we're facing now. The conversations we had with the Secretary of State as a party yesterday was the 29th of June is, his, is now his final deadline. So that's where all parties have to get around the table. For the DUP and Sinn Féin still to be sitting here this evening and come back to something that Conor Murphy did when he was Minister, to cast in those dispersions when at this minute in time, all the parties should be getting the Northern Ireland evolved institutions up and running. The matter of the Secretary of State and his impartiality as, as Chair, I think is a side issue now that other parties are throwing in. Let's park that. They've always been, there's always been accusations. Well, you can't about, park who's but, well, going sorry. to be the chairman. No, no but let's, let's park the, the, the frustration over it or the disagreement over it. There's been frustrations over his impartiality since the start of these talks. And this is now the third set of talks we're in. Mm -hmm. So we need to get this moving. We need to get Northern Ireland actually in the place where it should be mm -hmm. for an agreement to be reached on the 29th of June. The, if the there's more money coming from London, we need an assembly up and running to spend. And the bottom, the bottom line here is no matter how strong the DEP gets or how strong Sinn Féin get, neither alone can govern Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland only works on the basis of sharing, interdependence and power sharing in terms of, of government. And we all have to work together to make sure we get the and best. That's only that's one party, the good. Every party okay. apart from one. Is are you going to make a willingness an issue to go forward? Of the impartiality? I'm not sure if, if we're, we're all here 
outlining their own agenda. Yeah. The DUP are sitting at home with their feet up and their slippers watching the Well, well they're, 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 they're in London the negotiating the no, deal. Instead of looking for the there's Swinkers 20, machine, there's, 20, there's, the 20, right. there's 27 MLAs mm. that are sitting in their houses tonight here in the north watching this TV. Yeah. And Nelson's on as either a commentator or a, a party member. Well, we don't know which. Yeah, because our MPs are... Hold on, hold on. You will have a chance to come back. Go ahead. I'm here by invite. You're no... The question was, you were here by invite as a commentator, not as a member of the DUP. Uh, so that's the bottom so line. You're, you're an irrelevance to the talks that oh. we're having in Stormont. <laughs> Thank you. The reality is, is that we do, and we have made it explicitly clear all along, we do want all of the parties involved mm. in the executive. Uh, we want to see an agreement. We've been working very hard. No, but the question I asked you was, are you going to make an issue of the uh, impartiality well, or your perceived lack of impartiality on we, behalf we, of the we government? We made an issue of the, the lack of impartiality of, of James Brokenshire from the outset, mm. but we've been managing to uh, conduct the talks uh, right through, as, as Robin said, this is the third phase. We want to see them concluded in a matter of days, not on the 29th of June. That's our clear intention. We want to see all of the parties involved fully in that, and we want an agreement which means that all of the parties are in so, the executive. So what are you going to give to make that happen? What, what, what compromise are you going to make? Well, bear in mind, what we're trying to get is the implementation of agreements which are already yeah. made. Those agreements involve compromise. So you now want us to compromise well, on the compromise. I, I, I'm asking, I suppose, will you say, OK, let's uh, let the judge let inquiry and RHI take its course. We'll sit down with uh, Arlene Foster as DUP First Minister. Well, the no mission of that happening. We are sitting down talking to Arlene Foster as it is. The difficulty is I'm on here uh, answering what yeah. I'm going to compromise. No, I understand No one that. from the DUP is yeah. on I explaining that. how they intend We're very grateful contribute. for you being here, but they, that's why I'm asking you for your opinion. Yeah, but, I mean, that's, that's the deficit in the BBC's approach yeah. to all Well, it's, we did ask. It's not our deficit yeah. if they don't accept our invitation. But you take a proxy like candidate instead. Well, he's here as a, a uh, spokesman who... Okay. Fair enough. For himself, we but who's very close to the thinking of the DUP. Let's put it like that. That's an old phrase, isn't it? have applied ourselves since mm. the beginning of the talk very earnestly to try and find an agreement. Uh, we have talked uh, day and night, uh, if they were available, and many times they weren't, uh, to the DUP to try and secure an agreement. We've been talking uh, earnestly to all of the other parties to try and secure an agreement. We want that agreement. We want the executive up and working because it's in the best interest of the people we all collectively represent. Uh, and that's what we, we wish to do. We had further discussions with the DUP yesterday. We'll be meeting them again tomorrow, Thursday and Friday, in an effort to get this thing crunched and get the Assembly back up on the road again. But we also need to know what's shaping up in Downing Street, yeah. because that will have implications. Even if, it, as Arlene Foster says, this is simply an economic package, such an economic package will be delivered by the executive and the assembly. So it has implications, and we need to know what's above the table and what might be under the table. Compromise from the DUP? Yeah. The political parties at Stormont all say that they want devolution. Mm. And we believe that devolution is the best outcome for Northern Ireland. The difficulty has been that one particular party has drawn red lines. Other parties haven't. And that creates a difficulty if you say that you will not go back into the executive, not go back into the assembly, unless well, that, certain... That's not answering the yeah. question no, what sorry. compromise the DP but, but, might be but prepared but to make. I'm, I'm not sure you might even know that. Sorry, just say if yeah. I could make the point. Very quickly, please. Yes. First of all, let me say, the reason... Well, not first of all, just make a quick point, <laughs> if you would, please. The reason that I'm here tonight is yeah. that I was brought on as a commentator, yeah. not yeah. as a representative for the DP. Just to make that clear. Yeah. The point that I've said there as regards the Democratic Unionist Party is that... They are willing to tomorrow, whatever time it takes, to get there into the assembly, get the executive uh, up and running. It is the Democratic okay. Unionist Party. I'm always with that. Uh, 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 Dolores Kelly. Well, uh, uh, you know, we got into this mess because of the arrogance of the DUP, as well as a number of scandals uh, and, and allegations of, of misuse and, uh, yeah. and at best negligence and incompetence in terms of management department. Yeah. And, and we want it up and running again. But yeah. let's not forget uh, that all of the parties here, and the Sinn Féin and the DUP in the past, excluded the yeah. other parties, both okay. whilst the, 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 the last year of the executive, executive was not pretty. There was mm -hmm. serious problems in terms of lack of accountability, in terms of arrogance of power, abuse of power. We haven't had a proper approach in terms of paramilitarism. Right. Indeed, we have people, parties okay. closing up the paramilitaries. There's right. major structural problems there. Thank people you. have been in denial around. Thank you all very much indeed. Yeah. So by the end of play tomorrow, perhaps, we might have a better idea of what glue has been used to stick the DUP and the Tories together. How long that bond might hold will no doubt be the subject of much comment and speculation. But from this Spotlight programme, I wish you a very good night.